ceasefire declared over East Aleppo in the aftermath of what is being termed tonight a meltdown of humanity. Evacuation of the injured is beginning right now, but will it hold? Good evening. The final overture to the ceasefire has been utterly degraded, with reports of civilians shot, armed men herded and taken away. The UN describing the final hours as a meltdown of humanity. Turkey and Russia are the guarantors of the ceasefire, and, as we speak, the injured are being loaded onto buses. Later, rebels will be allowed to carry light arms with them. This amid soul-searching by politicians here and abroad as to how the West remained so neutered during the entire atrocity. Few more so than the United States, whose ambassador to the United Nations is tonight belatedly holding Russia's feet to the fire. To the Assad regime, Russia and Iran, three member states behind the conquest of and carnage in Aleppo, you bear responsibility for these atrocities. Also on tonight's programme, as southern rail workers stayed at home, so too did some commuters. Others battled onto alternative forms of transport. With passengers' jobs in jeopardy and family lives under strain, rail bosses and unions are to hold talks tomorrow. The elves are cheerful, shoppers less so, as a big rise in clothes and petrol prices sends inflation higher. And as growing numbers of young people report confusion over their gender identity, we ask one trans teenager if greater awareness is helping or harming children's mental health. Why is that a problem if more children are exploring their gender identity? Why should that be something that we don't want to happen? Plus, it's the most basic of human needs going to the lavatory. Tonight, in another look at No Go Britain, we meet the family told by a cinema the nearest toilet they can use is an hour away and find disabled people with no choice but to be changed on the floor because there are so few accessible facilities. If we can get so that the law is changed, then these parents of children with special needs will have time to look after their children rather than having to fight for basic human rights of going to the toilet. It is a hellish corner of a city already reduced to hell on earth. But in the past few minutes, Russia says all military action in eastern Aleppo has stopped, with a deal to allow militant fighters and civilians to leave. This programme has just learned that buses carrying the most badly injured people out of the city will depart within this hour. But there are tens of thousands of civilians left in Aleppo, doctors in ruined hospitals, children who were trapped under heavy fire, who will guarantee their safety? In our first report tonight, here is Diana Magney. Men, women and children still stream from the battlegrounds in what the UN calls the complete meltdown of humanity in Aleppo. The very young and the very weak, escorted by Syrian troops. But as the regime raises the flag over yet another district seized from the opposition, a deal at last. A 48-hour ceasefire starting early Wednesday morning and brokered by Turkey to get the thousands still left in the tiny square kilometre that eludes Assad out of Aleppo. Because whatever the Syrian regime says, there are still many civilians as well as fighters who fear what may happen to them in government hands. We've been receiving reports that many civilians have been detained by pro-government forces. We've also been informed that pro-government forces have been entering civilian homes and killing those individuals found inside, including women and children. 82 civilians, the UN said, including 11 women and 13 children, killed in four different districts as the militias went from house to house. Reports that drew the harshest of words against Russia and Syria within the Security Council, even as the details on the ceasefire trickled out, a ceasefire the powerless US has had nothing to do with. Are you truly incapable of shame? Is there literally nothing? that can shame you? Is there no act of barbarism against civilians, no execution of a child that gets under your skin, that just creeps you out a little bit? Is there nothing you will not lie about or justify? But as Samantha Power spoke of Aleppo as a stain on the conscience of the world, Syrian state TV dubbed this a victory over terrorism. Regime footage showing the sandbagged positions of men alleged to have fought under the black flag of jihad 
proof for them that their approach was justified. One ominous photograph taken yesterday of men in eastern Aleppo singled out by the regime. Following weeks of reports of men of fighting age being separated out for screening. This video emerging over the weekend of men accused by the regime of belonging to terrorist groups. The UN now demanding the presence of independent observers to make sure this isn't the last time they're ever seen. Across Syria today, demonstrations in rebel-held areas, not against the regime, but against the leadership of the Syrian opposition for letting Aleppo fall. Members of the moderate Free Syrian Army out on the streets of Idlib and the hardline extremists who share the same enemy in Bashar al-Assad but have very different goals. For four years now, Aleppo has been a tale of two cities, the government-controlled west and the rebel-held east, now a wasteland, a shell of what it once was. Ruins which at once represent the cruelty of all sides in this conflict, the waste that is war and the failure of the international community to react. Tyler Magne reporting. Well, earlier I spoke to Zahir al-Shamali, a citizen journalist in the last rebel-held enclave in Aleppo. I started by asking him how many people are left around you right now? Yes, so there is more. There is between 50 to 60,000 people uh, around here in the east of Aleppo, the, the, the remaining part that uh, is under control of the rebels, uh, it's less, it's maybe, uh, it's just like uh, four to five neighbors that uh, under control of the rebels uh, at this time, and there is between 50 to 60,000 uh, people are trapped here and uh, under siege, and you and was and has been getting and bonding with a hell with a great amount of. Uh, bombardment during the last uh, few weeks. United Nations says there was a meltdown of humanity in the city just before the ceasefire. What are they talking about? Y yes, the it's total, it has totally collapsed. The uh, you know in the eyes of the people of the civilian of Aleppo here, uh, when when you are in, at some point you are just in the streets running from the regime who were. Uh, just rushing to take your areas, and you see your neighbors, you see your maybe family members, members that are being that are being injured, that are being trapped under the rubble as the, as the attacks haven't stopped in their area, and they are just uh, running with their lives. They cannot help the injuries in the streets. They cannot help the sound of of, of a woman, maybe or a child who are who is screaming under the rubble, and uh, you cannot help them. Even you can't you cannot help them with any. Uh, with, with uh, calling an ambulance or, or with, uh, trying to grab someone and to grab the injured people or to drag to, to drag the injuries from under the rubble and you just run with your life. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, would make you would make, would make you break would left your heart breaking and we left you in a shock that how how far we got. Uh, in this uh, in this brutal attacks from the regime and from the Russian to make us uh, suffer like this, to make the people uh, suffer at this point, uh, this scene uh, will never be erased from the European people who have been through a lot during the last uh, six months. So here, do you hear, do you know in the last few days, in these very bad days, in the last bad days, how many people have died in your area? Uh, in my area, there, you know, as there is no hospitals, as there is uh, uh, no uh, like way to, to know, get to know about the uh, the, the injuries or killed people, uh, but there is you know a kind of uh, a daily death statics that we have, a daily airstrikes statics that we have. Like we we used to have in the last uh, in the last week, especially more than like hundred air raids and uh, thousands of artillery uh, attacks and uh, about the death people and injuries there was, uh, you know, in there before, uh, like we used to have in uh, uh, hospitals, like before the hospitals were all, went all out of service. In this, in such a situation like this, we used to have more than, more than three to four hundred injuries and uh, more than 50 to 10 to 100 
uh, death. It depends on uh, the, the brutality of the attacks. Zuhir, thank you very, very much for talking to us, and I hope you get out safe tonight. Thank you so much. You too. While the pressure on Syria and its Russian allies to guarantee safety for those leaving Aleppo is coming from all sides, from the UN chief, Ban Ki-moon, to the UK Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. But tonight, amid all the promises, the fate of Aleppo's people depends not on words, but on action. And that, as our foreign affairs correspondent Jonathan Rugman reports, has so far been conspicuous by its absence. While the UN talks of a complete meltdown of humanity in Aleppo, Western leaders see it as one of the worst breakdowns of the international order since the massacres in Srebrenica over 20 years ago. And once again, a sense of guilt at trying to stop it, but failing. There is a humanitarian emergency, a humanitarian deadline which we must condemn. There are lives at stake. Tens of thousands have been detained, and it is our duty to act. Politics have taken too long. The situation is disastrous. It is breaking one's heart. One really has to say that. And we will do anything to make particularly the Syrian regime, but also Russia and Iran, realize that this is about human beings. And in the House of Commons, another emergency debate, only two months on from the last. We all warned that if nothing changed, eastern Aleppo would be destroyed by Christmas, and that is exactly what is coming to pass. The slaughter shames us all, no matter on what side we sit on these plans, no matter what our actions were at the time. We are shamed as a nation by this. When I ask myself if in Britain we on, have we on these benches done enough for the innocent people in Syria, I cannot put my hand on my heart and say that we have. From Labour's front bench, the suggestion that drones could drop humanitarian aid. If we fear that, that manned flights would be too dangerous, as I know the honourable gentleman sitting next to the foreign secretary does and he sits and shakes his head, then the government must consider using unmanned drones or GPS-guided parachutes. Not just the looks of her ministers, but the Prime Minister's own non-attendance told us all we needed to know about government hopes of a breakthrough, with perhaps the most powerful speech from maybe the least expected quarter. I think we have come to a point where it's impossible to intervene anywhere, that we lack the political will as a West to intervene. But I have some hope out of this terrible tragedy in Syria, which is we are beginning to learn the price of not intervening. Yeah. But let's be clear now that if you don't shape the world, you will be shaped by it. Yeah. This was a Commons almost nauseous at its own futility. The Foreign Secretary condemned Russia and China for vetoing a UN resolution for a seven-day ceasefire. And he told MPs the option of airdrops had been looked at with great care. Even if Russia were to give its consent, our aircraft would still have to fly over areas of Syria that are hotly contested by a multitude of armed groups, including Daesh and Al-Qaeda. They would make every effort to shoot down a British plane, and a lumbering, low-flying transport aircraft would be a sitting duck. Mr Johnson then launching this broadside at Labour's refusal to back military action in Syria three years ago. We as a House of Commons, we as a country, we vacated that space into which Russia stepped, beginning its own bombing campaign on behalf of Assad in 2015. And ever since that vote, our ability to influence events in Syria or to protect civilians or compel the delivery of aid has been severely limited. In New York, too, another debate at the UN Security Council. Pleas for civilians to be allowed to leave Aleppo and for aid to be allowed in. Yet this city's revolution is now in its final hours, and the Russians will dictate the kind of peace they want, just as they have dictated the course of this war. Jonathan Rugman reporting from Paris. I'm joined by Ole Salvang. Deputy Director of Emergencies for Human Rights Watch from Westminster by the Conservative MP Crispin Blunt, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. And with me here, Reem Asil, Chair of the Syrian Platform for Peace, who fled Syria in 2012. Ule Solvang, 
to what extent can Human Rights Watch, who obviously have people in the region but not absolutely in country on site, to what extent can you really monitor that what is being promised is going to be delivered? Well, that is the big question, of course. Uh, nobody has independent observers on the ground in Aleppo to do this systematically at this point. And, and this is really one of the key points right now that, uh, that we are calling for, that Human Rights Watch is calling for. One issue that could help protect civilians is to put in place independent monitors, monitors m mandated by the UN to oversee evacuations, to make sure that there is transparency, make sure that there is no reprisals against civilians or against fighters who have surrendered, because that is one of our main concerns. We have seen this in the past. Human Rights Watch has documented executions in other similar situations where government forces have come in and taken over areas that have been controlled by opposition forces for a long time. So you, like us, are dependent on the United Nations, who so far have had terribly little access, but appear at least to be laying on the buses. So presumably they can monitor at least those people that get that far. Well, I think what we're all relying on in terms of information from the ground at this point is uh, people on the ground that we have been working with for many, many years, uh, people, some of them whom I've met in person and people who we trust. And then we try to corroborate and verify that information by comparing people's statements. Um, but it's very, very difficult, and particularly in the chaotic situation that has been in the last few days, where people have not been able to move, where there's very little uh, internet connection, for example, it has been, it's extremely difficult to verify any of the rumors, any of the allegations that are coming out. But again, as I said, past experience, uh, past behavior by Syrian government forces make us very, very concerned. Oli Solvang, thank you very much indeed for joining us there. Uh, Crispin Blunt, watching the House of Commons today, the candor was perhaps admirable, but the absolute failure of the Western powers, and our own power included, has been mortifying. Well, it's the failure of the whole international community, and it depends what start point you take. Do you take 2011, when to a degree we encourage the rebels against uh, President Assad to, to really to go to war against him. Um, and then at that stage we weren't prepared to then go and equip and support them. And I don't think we should have been, but they no, got the it, impression, indeed, indeed, they got the impression we were going to. And that presumably that, was informed by the chaotic and desperate decision to invade Iraq beforehand. Yes, and some of the logic about revisiting the 2013 position um, we were presented with a mission to disarm the regime of its chemical weapons. Uh, the means was going to be an air campaign. It was certainly not clear to me how that was going to work. Uh, and if we were being asked another question as to whether we wanted to get engaged in this uh, civil war to take the government down and be engaged in regime change, uh, that then would have begged a whole series of other questions. Uh, it might now be us as the air power on the side of the uh, rebels against the regime, eliminating the final part of the uh, opposition in Aleppo. Let me just uh, pause, you, pause you there, Crispin Blunt. Um, uh, as uh, Reem Asil, just supposing you had Crispin Blunt's ear at, back there in 2013, what did you want the Western powers to do? Well, um, Syrian and British Syrian activists here in the UK, uh, they have been pushing and lobbying for the last three years for some sort of intervention, protection of civilians on top of everything, uh, no bombing zone, and uh, there were some military voices that said that this is feasible without... Uh, you know, getting human hands involved in it. But again, the UK hesitated uh, on several occasions uh, to intervene in, in Syria until we came to a point where it seems that it's not possible anymore. Well, surely that would have been perhaps one possibility would have been to declare a, a UN authorised, even if the Permanent Five didn't necessarily agree with it, uh, no-fly zone, which we would police. And if, if, if the Russians chose to uh, attack us, well, we would have a very serious situation on our hands, Christian Blunt. Well, I think you've explained the problem rather well. And this is Russia's responsibility. Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. 
it is Russia that's prevented the Security Council coming to a, uh, coming to a position, and it's Russia that's decided to intervene uh, in this conflict. And the responsibility for the conduct of the campaign, uh, therefore, sits with Russia. So will our, that's will, our, where we... will our government be moving now towards major new enhanced sanctions against Russia for its performance in Syria? We've then, what will uh, define what's the appropriate thing to take is the criminal responsibility. And, the, and in this day and age, we now have far more recording of the events that are taking place there. And I hope that that at least acts as some restraint so we're not going to see the situation as bad as it would have been under sieges of previous eras uh, when a uh, victorious army that has then taken a great deal of casualties in capturing a city then wreaks its vengeance on the people that it uh, uh, that it then has at its mercy. Right. Let me just pause you there just for a moment because, Reem Asil, that is interesting. Crispin Blunt is raising the spectre of the possibility of holding Russia to account for what it has done in Syria. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that will ever happen? I would like to believe so, but at the moment, the highest priority, actually, before bringing uh, Russia uh, ag uh, against, uh, like, uh, in the International Criminal Court or Assad or whatever, is ensuring, actually, the protection of civilians, ensuring that either Russia or Assad or Iranian militias or all, all the Assad allies don't use, uh, don't target civilians indiscriminately, uh, use aerial bombardment on a daily basis, uh, bombing schools, uh, hospitals, besieging areas, using mm. starvation uh, techniques. Let, all, all let me put of... that to Christine Blunt. I mean, we're really on to something here. Is there really a possibility, we will, very briefly, that we will hold Russia to account after this in the international courts uh, for what they have done in Syria? Well, I sincerely hope that the, uh, at the time scale of this you can't predict, uh, but the evidence uh, these days is now all around us uh, of what has happened. And you know, people have, we've seen coverage coming out even today of uh, iPhone coverage of things that has, that has happened to people. There is much greater evidential trail now. Uh, and so sometime in the future, I hope that people responsible for crimes uh, in Aleppo and elsewhere in this conflict are going to be held to account. But there is also, quite rightly, the other, the other issues we have to focus on now, which is uh, trying to make sure that this ceasefire, and indeed we've failed with endless ceasefires before, right. actually taking advantage of those opportunities to bring this conflict to an end. We had an opportunity, a strong opportunity, a year ago when the 20 nations of the International Syria Support Group got Chris round the table and laid out a way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We will be back to you and your committee to see whether we ever do pursue this on the basis that we've discussed right now. And thank you very much indeed, Reem Asil. Thank you. Cathy. Thanks, John. Now, the globe-trotting boss of a giant energy firm with substantial interests in Russia is in line to become America's next Secretary of State, as Donald Trump named ExxonMobil Chief Rex Tillerson as his choice. He could face a tough nomination battle, though, with leading Republicans already voicing concerns about how far he'll stand up against Vladimir Putin. From Washington, Porrick O'Brien reports. Two institutions define America's new top diplomat, ExxonMobil. The Texan joined the company over 40 years ago. Well, my philosophy is to make money. <laughs> and so if I can drill... Yes. Uh, and make money, then that's what I want to do. And the Boy Scouts of America. He'll learn leadership, pride and self-achievement. A lifelong member and president. My whole life is defined because I was a Boy Scout. At the weekend, Donald Trump extolling the virtues of the ultimate corporate diplomat. He's much more than a business executive. I mean, he's a world-class player. To me, a great advantage is he knows many of the players. And he knows him well. For some in Washington, the fly in the CV ointment, more a bear with wings. He's close to Vladimir Putin, awarded the Order of Friendship Medal. At the weekend, the Trump camp playing down the relationship, though. Rex Tillerson of Exxon has dealt with Russia for many years. It's not like he's pounding down vodka with Vladimir Putin, the local bar, but he's dealt with him in a business context. It wasn't vodka, it was champagne. As Exxon's boss, he pushed back against sanctions on Russia after the annexation of Crimea. Russian cyber attacks in the run-up to the election mean Democrat alarm bells ringing today ahead of confirmation hearings. Coziness with Vladimir Putin is very alarming and should 
should have been eliminated him, frankly. Uh, right now, his approach to the sanctions on Russia uh, because of their aggression in Europe should be enough to say perhaps another relationship with the administration, but not Secretary of State. The talk in Washington is of Tillerson doing a reverse Nixon, causing up to Russia, talking tough to China. Then there's the Middle East, his worldview less clear here. Will he try to change his boss's mind, for example, on scrapping the Iran nuclear agreement? But in reality, Trump wants people who can clinch deals with global strongmen. Because I know Russia really well because I worked there for many, many years. It's difficult to get a solid take on Rex Tillerson's geopolitical worldview. He's not a Washington insider. He doesn't have that traditional diplomatic track record. The best we can do is point to his cheerleaders since appointment, people like Dick Cheney, a Condoleezza Rice, part of the old Bush administration vanguard. Described by those who know him as tough, moral, knows how to keep shareholders happy. The challenge now when tensions arise between doing the deal and doing what's right. Not many in East Aleppo, one imagines, own shares. Parag O'Brien reporting from Washington. There's a glimpse of relief for hundreds of thousands of commuters who've been facing the worst rail disruption for almost 20 years. Talks will be held tomorrow, aimed at resolving the strike by drivers on Southern Rail which has brought the network's entire service to a halt. Tomorrow's walkout will continue, though, and it's threatening to be a bit of a strike hit Christmas elsewhere, too, as our political correspondent Michael Crick now reports. Across Sussex, Surrey and South London today, the 300,000 or so people who normally use Southern Rail suffered huge problems. I've never seen something so bad as this. Yeah. Terrible. All the buses are packed, totally packed. People's jobs at stake, really. I think the government needs to step in. This strike and a two-day RMT strike on Southern next week are about working practices, the roles of drivers, conductors and guards. But the Transport Secretary says they're not about safety, really, but politics. The Southern trains from my constituency that I catch very often already just have driver operating them, actually no guards, and we're not trying to remove guards from other services, we're just changing the nature of their jobs. No pay cuts, no loss of job security. So of course this is politically motivated. Yet the union, ASLEV, who claimed 100% support today, say jobs will be threatened long term. They agree it's political, but... It's not our politics that's causing this, it's Chris Grayling. He's playing games with passengers and playing pass uh, games with, with, with the services. He's trying to impose a discredited, old-fashioned working system from the 1980s. So he's the one playing the politics. And the unions cite a top transport department official who told a commuter meeting earlier this year. Over the next three years, we're going to be having punch-ups and we will see industrial action. And I want your support. Of train drivers, he said. We have got to break them. And added... They will have to decide if they want to give a good service or get the hell out of my industry. Mr Wilkinson then told MPs he'd said sorry for his remarks. I stand by that apology. Uh, I regret very much uh, any offence that has been taken. And Aslev say the Transport Department vetoed a compromise deal. They nearly agreed with Southern Rail in September. So you think that Chris Grayling and his department kiboshed a possible deal last September? Yes. I really do believe that the Department for Transport ha 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 stopped a potential resolution to this whole mess. But this Sussex MP says it's only right for ministers to push Southern Rail in their dealings with the unions. Well, I think the government should be encouraging train operators across the country uh, to modernise uh, their network. I think that's very important. People expect, with more and more people using the railways, people expect uh, the latest technology uh, to be used. And I would be the first to criticise the government if they weren't pushing for modernisation. With both sides set to meet at the conciliation service ACAS tomorrow, an Aslev source told me tonight that companies signalled they're willing to move, and so they could reach a deal. And ACAS could be busy, since Argos delivery drivers and post office workers are both due to strike two next week.
Well, the leader of Britain's biggest union, Unite, which has organised that strike at Argos, is now facing a challenge for the top job. Gerald Coyne announced today that he'll stand against Len McCluskey in next spring's leadership contest, and he joins us now. Uh, Gerald Coyne, when you look across the board at rail workers, post office workers, Argos delivery drivers, your union there, all representing their members by going on strike in the run-up to Christmas and over Christmas, they're betraying, aren't they, hundreds of thousands of workers who rely on those services? No, not at all. I mean, the right to strike and the choice that members make when they make that decision is not an easy one. It's a very difficult choice. Uh, and in terms of the specifics of the individual strikes, the solution to them are in very different ways. And I'm glad to hear that ACAS are involved in the rail dispute. Equally, they're also going to be involved in the Argos dispute. But you might be representing your members well, but what about all the other workers who rely on those services that are now being disrupted? Do you not feel any sort of responsibility Well, the right to there? remove your labour is obviously a fundamental human right, and although that does cause difficulties and inconvenience, nevertheless, that balanced against the uh, opportunity that workers have to, in the Argos uh, example, reclaim a £700 payment that they've been waiting for almost two years from their employer and they've been batted into the long grass consistently. Now, I know you're pitching yourself as a, a reforming challenger to Len McCluskey. I just wonder how far that reform extends in your relationship with Labour. How far, for example, will you reform your relationship with Jeremy Corbyn? I mean, will you continue the same level of donations, the same level of backing for him, which is to the hilt at the moment? Well, first and foremost, the reason that I'm standing for the General Secretary's position is because, actually, I want to focus on the issues that are important to our members, on the protection of them in the world of work and making sure that they feel the union is providing the services that they want. So Jeremy Corbyn can't count on your support? Jeremy Corbyn's the leader of the Labour Party and I know that workers uh, do better under a Labour government, of course. So that's unconditional support for Jeremy Corbyn? In terms of Unite's position, it exactly uh, shows the problem that we've been suffering from in that actually determining where Jeremy Corbyn sits in relation to the trade union movement is not about what he will be successful as the potential Prime Minister for the country. Well, yeah, but how likely is that when you look at the polls, the worst in opposition for Labour since 1983? I mean, do you have any hope that Jeremy Corbyn will turn it around and win an election? Well, the reality is that is for the membership of the party to decide if he's the leader and beyond that for the electorate in the country to decide it. But you must have a view on his chances. It is the membership of Unite that will make a decision about the General Secretary of unite the union. I'm not standing for the General Secretary of the Labour Party. Well, let me ask you this. It's, is it more important for your members to keep Trident or to keep Jeremy Corbyn, who's opposed to Trident renewal? I'm very clear that in terms of our support for our members who uh, now the renewal has taken place and the main gate decision has been taken, that clearly that was the right decision in supporting uh, that membership that we have. Uh, in terms of the issues as they go to the public in the general election, that's for the Labour Party and the leader of the Labour Party to determine. Gerald Coyne, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. John. Well, if it's a struggle to get Christmas presents delivered on time, it's a struggle to buy them too. As new figures show inflation soared to its highest in two years and the steep fall in the pound since the Brexit vote is expected to push up the cost of living still further as manufacturers pass on their higher costs to consumers. As our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy, now reports. Festive elves enjoy a little Christmas jig in this colossal shopping centre in North London. You'd definitely find gold rings here, maybe even a partridge in a pear tree. Certainly there's no shortage of shoppers. But does the fact that prices are rising at their fastest rate in two years worry anyone? Today's inflation figures don't appear to have burst the Christmas bubble, certainly if the number of people in this shopping centre is anything to go by. Many I've spoken to say they are still spending, but equally they're worried about the future and prices rising. And they're right to be, because what we learnt today is that inflation is steadily creeping upwards. And that increase is far worse for businesses who are having to deal with rapidly rising costs but who are not yet passing on those costs in full to shoppers like these. Oh, no, I think I am worried about it. I've definitely spent less on Christmas this year because the because of prices rising, definitely. It's you can, scary. You, it's scary. It's scary out there, yeah. I think everything's going up at the moment. Fruit and veg, everything's going expensive. You can feel it already, yeah, can you? Yeah, you can already feel it, yeah. 
I'm worried about it. I'm, uh, I'm retired, so you know my income is effectively fixed, and therefore my spending power is going to reduce as time goes by. And here's the reason to worry. Inflation for consumers has risen to an annual rate of 1.2%. But the price of goods as they leave the factories are rising at 2.3%. And the cost of raw materials needed to make those goods is up by 12.9%. And that's what matters to this toy maker in Folkestone. Their 1,500 plus toys are designed in the UK but manufactured in the Far East. So as the pound has fallen, it's cost them more to import their products. Some retailers... Liz Island started making wooden jigsaw puzzles in her back garden shed with husband Peter in 1986. The business has so far been shielded from the pound's weakness because Liz bought the dollars they needed before the referendum, a strategy known as hedging. But that hedge has now run out, so she has no choice but to put up her prices. The problem is, for people out there, they're not really aware of what's about what's coming down the line. No, I don't think they are. I don't think they are. Um, but I think January will be difficult with regard to price increases, not just from the toy industry, but from every industry where product is bought in dollars and bought into the UK and then transferred and sold in sterling. The decision to leave the EU will cost this business about a million dollars thanks to the fall in the pound next year. Now they've done everything they can to try and squeeze their own costs, including things like cheaper printers and telephone systems and different types of packaging. But despite that, they will still need to raise their prices by about 10% in January and now they're even looking to shrink the size of certain products. So what does that look like? Well, a train set like this one that used to include 112 pieces might have to shrink to 108. We're considering everything. Um, we don't think that there's anything within the business that we haven't looked at, but we clearly continue to need to keep looking um, and save those costs where we can. So the message for shoppers, tis the season to be jolly, yes, but enjoy it while it lasts. Siobhan Kennedy there. Now, it's a matter of basic human dignity, but for a quarter of a million disabled people, finding appropriate places to go to the loo is often an undignified struggle. We've already reported on the lack of proper facilities in public places around the country. Tonight, in the latest in our No Go Britain series, we reveal more shocking stories. The parents forced to change their children on filthy toilet floors. And the cinema who suggested a young customer make a 50-minute round trip up the road to use the loo. Jackie Adenergy Williams reports. When you're out and about and you need a wee and there's no proper facilities when you've got to go you've got to go that's the way it is I know when you're out and about and you're having fun but you've got to go so you've got to run when you got to go the students of Ashfield Academy in Leicester have written a song and produced a video about the most basic of needs. Put yourselves in our position. How would you like it if you couldn't access a toilet? It should be simple to go to the toilet when you're away from home. But for some disabled people, it's far from easy. 17-year-old Luke hopes that the song will raise awareness about the problems he faces every time he wants to visit a public place. Why did you create the song in the first place? Why do I have out? Well, right, eh? It all is in the world when we arrive up every day on the hill. We're in your very place. When he goes out for the day, um, it's quite awkward because he has to be changed on the floor because it's quite unpleasant. What Luke's campaigning for are these, changing places toilets, with ceiling hoist and large benches without which people face the indignity of being changed on the floor, as we saw in a film we broadcasted earlier this year. And I just want you to notice there's a hook so I don't have to put my handbag on the floor, but it's absolutely fine to put my daughter on the floor to change her. I'm trying to think what you're kneeling on. Try not to think what you're kneeling in here. One of the families featured were the Pierces, with their son Sammy. 
Sammy's grandmother, Kath Pierce, was appalled to see the footage of her grandson being changed on a filthy floor. Along came the sun and dried up all the rain. An itsy wincy spider climbed up the spot again. So, how did you feel when you saw the first No Go Britain film? I was really, really angry. I'm, to see Sammy lying on the floor broke my heart. And I was so angry. I phoned Joe and asked them where that would be filmed and found out it was Tesco's. I went upstairs and emailed the chief exec. And um, they're going to put the change in place in Tesco's at Kingston. We got the email from the head of architecture at Tesco's saying that the budget had been approved and they're going to make the changes to the store in Milton Keynes. But they, they go, they've gone quiet since then. If we can get so that the law is changed, then these parents of children with special needs will have time to look after their children rather than having to fight for basic human rights. Of going to the toilet when they want to, in comfort, and not on the floor, goodness sake. It's great news about Tesco's, but there are only 900 of these toilets around the country, and a quarter of a million people need them. So the Pierces have had to take drastic action. So we bought a motorhome. Not everyone can afford that, obviously, because they're, they're expensive. Um, and me and Joe took a lot of our savings out to do it. We've given up with other people's toilets and we take our own one with us now. <laughs> Is it really fair to expect families to go to these lengths just so their children can have their basic needs met? I myself have had to adapt to the lack of adequate public facilities by only using the toilet at home once in the morning and once at night, which probably isn't good for me. I'm going to Worthing to see Laura and William who have been campaigning to get more changing places toilets locally. Laura has been in contact with her local Marks and Spencers to see if they will put in a toilet that oh, she can well, use with William. <laughs> Could you tell me about your experiences with Marks and Spencers? Um, 20 minutes away from here, we've got a really big Marks and Spencers. And in the store, they've got three large disabled toilets. They've also got a big baby changing area. We can't use any of those. So when we go there, William can't go to the toilet. So I've asked them numerous times if they can make some adjustments so that he can use the toilet there so we can spend longer there have lunch there etc and i've been asking them this for years and they've just constantly said no marks and spencers told us that there are no immediate plans to introduce changing places toilets in their stores in the uk there are no legal obligations for retailers to add these facilities to their existing premises or even a law that insists any new buildings include a toilet that William can use. Without the building regs changing, nothing's going to change. Um, for instance, there's a big shopping development being built nearby. Um, they're having a brand new Cineworld cinema, and I've asked them to provide a changing places toilet, and they've said no because it's not in building regulations. They don't have to. I received an email from them which told me that if I wanted to, I could visit the Brighton cinema because there's a changing places toilet nearby. To suggest that we leave the cinema to go somewhere else, would they suggest that to another customer? Let's go see how long it would take from the cinema to the toilet that they're suggesting. OK, excellent. This is my local Cineworld, and if you imagine we've just come out of a film, halfway through a film, I've managed to get William out of the building, I've put his coat on, it's taken me a few minutes, and now we're going to go to the toilet. I'm at the disabled change places toilet and I found a disabled parking space but there's a bollard so if I park in the space um, I can't get the ramp down so I need to park, get William out and then reverse the van back into the space so that's what I'm going to do now. Forty-four minutes just to get back to the car park and then 51 minutes to get back here and you still have to get back to your seats so that's a whole hour just to go to the toilet at back so we probably missed most of the film 
Sydney World say they are sorry for any distress and they understand the family's frustrations. They say the cinema industry do not generally provide these facilities, but they will keep the situation under review. Back in Leicester, the Ashfield Academy students have had some success locally. King Power Stadium has done us proud. Now we can join in with the crowd. Premier League champions Leicester City, responding to a letter from Luke, have agreed to put in a changing places toilet. You're the first person to use this, Luke, so... If you work hard enough, you can make a change. This may be a big victory for Luke, but it is a very small step towards getting anywhere near enough toilets needed across the UK. Is it fair to rely on individuals to campaign for change? Should we not instead change the law? Very good question posed by Jackie Adenji Williams there. After the break, as record numbers of children seek advice on gender identity issues, we speak to one tra transgendered teenager, Felix, about his story and whether greater awareness will help. Welcome back. To mental distress, to anxiety about telling parents, a record number of children are seeking counselling about gender identity. The NSPCC says an average of eight young people every day are calling Childline about transgender issues, more than double the number from the year before. I've been talking to a transgender teenager, Felix, about his story. Someone will look at me and they might see a man and then I'll speak, I'll say hello and they'll assume that I'm a woman because of how my voice sounds. And so the first conversation I have to have with anyone is about being transgender. Felix says he's no longer confused about his gender, even if society might be. Two years ago he started passing as a man and he's now waiting to take testosterone and have surgery to remove breast tissue. He's had lots of support from family and friends. My mum and dad are separated. So my dad and my stepmom, they say, you know, whatever I need to do to feel happy, that's, that's what I should do and they'll support me. But they're really bad with like names and pronouns and stuff. They don't quite understand how important it is for me to be called the right name. Um, and then my mum, she's very supportive of like my identity and name and pronouns and all of that. She's really good with that but she doesn't want me to have any medical intervention. She thinks that it's unnatural. What do you say to critics who say that all the sort of media coverage of trans issues and publicity about it is in some way causing more children to sort of think about their gender in a way that they probably wouldn't have done in the past? Why is that a problem if more children are exploring their gender identity? Why should that be something that we don't want to happen? It's why not? Felix is one of a growing number of young people to question their gender identity. The NSPCC's Childline service today reports it's held record numbers of counselling sessions about trans and gender issues. In the last year, 2,796 children called the helpline, compared with 1,299 calls in the previous 12 months. On average, Childline receives eight calls a day from children worried their biological sex doesn't match their gender. One of the things that could be behind this is young people are coming forward with more of a confidence to talk about the issues. But the thing that's really worrying us is that when young people are coming out talking about transgender issues, they're often met with humiliation, bullying and abuse. Felix appears secure now in his identity, but he still questions himself. When people don't respect my identity, like when I'm referred to as she, it pushes me into this space of doubting myself. And it can be quite hard to feel like that. Like, I've already changed my name, I've got a male passport, I'm, I'm a good long way down the road. And to suddenly have that in your head, like, what if I'm making it all up? What if I've got it wrong? It's, it's quite scary. But it is, I know that's not true, it's just, 
society's doubt inside me. And that's, I, I'm moving on from that, but it is still a problem. Felix talking to me earlier. That's Channel 4 News. Good evening. Good evening.